Welcome to the Armored Soil Podcast, brought to you by the Renville County SWCD, where we look to bring real-life information on all things sustainable resources and agriculture. We believe that soil is invaluable and that protecting our soil is the key to sustaining all aspects of life. Please like and subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts. The information you will hear about is personal experience and is no way economic or agronomic advice. If you are interested in implementing these practices or techniques you hear about, we recommend you reach out to your agronomist and our CS office or local conservation district for ways to work them into your operation. For more information about our liability or podcast, please visit our website at renvillswcd.com. Welcome back to the Armored Soil Podcast, and today we have Brad and Naomi Freyholtz, who farm in southern Renville County. And to start off, would you like to tell me about your farming operation? Um, just kind of talk about your farm and your operation and how long you've been doing what you've been doing. Well, primarily corn and soybean growers, uh, about 650 plantable acres, and uh Quit doing fall tillage about five or six years ago and have since transitioned into strip till and now no till. And uh, seems to be working very well. How long have you farmed the ground? Uh, my or? whole life. Okay. So <laughs> awesome. What really helped you decide to start implementing soil health practices? Uh, Probably the main one one of the main things would be the expense of tillage and how expensive that was just getting with wear parts and hours on the equipment, fuel, and uh, I maybe twenty years ago already I had been planting oats before soybeans when we did tillage, and uh, I attended a meeting through uh, soil and water district and. They were talking about planting rye in winter and letting it grow and then spray it off, and it, it seemed like the perfect fit for me. So um, it took a few years. I had some had a neighbor that was thinking the same thing, and we were going to experiment, and, well, you always get busy in fall and end up just working it up. And then the one year I, I did find a no-till drill close by for sale and ended up buying it, and just quit doing tillage and corn stalks and started drilling rye instead. So, What's the biggest thing that you've seen, like, change in your operation with incorporating that rye and green seeding? Uh, I Well, the healthier soil, of course, it's just it's, it's in such better condition now. And... The, the growing season of 2024 with all the rain proved that. I really only had one one spot that that I had soil erosion and it's a it's a problem area that more needs to be done than just no till. But I noticed in the field where we hadn't tilled, just very subtle soil movement, very limited distance, you know, inches, not as where some other fields I just seen completely gully yeah. wash out. <laughs> That's awesome. What have you seen, Naomi? What do you think the biggest things you've seen as these operations have changed throughout the years? Um, I guess I've seen more like through the gardening perspective, um, planting um, like the pumpkin, squash, things like that. Um, it definitely, especially last year, um, the crop was phenomenal. I don't think I've ever had such a good crop. So you can definitely tell the health of the soil. And, yeah. Um, Cause we planted all of that and the potatoes, all of that out in the field versus the garden that we had on the yard. And it was a significant difference. Speaking a little bit more and elaborating more on like the gardening aspect of things. Have you like felt that these soil health principles can help with just normal gardening too, or do you think that it's more for large-scale farming operations? Oh, no. I think that it's for both, um, just an average garden and, you know, if you want to do a larger garden. Yeah. But and how big is your garden? Last year, I believe it was a quarter or a half of an acre. We didn't quite fill everything up. This year, um, yeah. Last year was pretty full. Yeah, I'd say it was a quarter acre. 
probably both years. And uh, mm -hmm. we're biased, but we thought both the squash and the pumpkin had a much deeper, richer taste to it right. <laughs> okay. yeah. than before. <laughs> yeah, we've noticed that in some of the trials that we've done too, just growing peas or tomatoes and like regenerative healthy soils that have had long term and conventional, you can really have a, like especially in the tomatoes, you get a lot sweeter taste. So yeah. that's one of the things to, I don't know, like you can't really quantify flavor and taste, but it's right. definitely there, I'd say. Well, we, we definitely noticed it. We yeah. both... You know, I can't remember if it was squash first or what, but it was just, we kind of looked at each other like, does this taste better? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. No, that's really cool. And it's, it's, it's fun to see, obviously, the large scale farming row crop, but also the ability to incorporate it into your, just like another hobby of growing vegetables. That is really cool to see. Like, yeah, you're not only doing it for your main source of income but also on your just in your backyard too that you can do it it's really it's not just really for cool. commodities yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> and i think that's the thing that's so sometime lost like people are like oh we need to till up our garden every spring or whatnot in order to grow these vegetables but you can do it for more than corn and soybeans right and one thing we started this year they call it the um Hugo culture gardening um, I don't know if you know much about mm -mm, that. No, um, tell me more. So it's basically um, hill culture or hill mound gardening, um, and they're raised beds, and this is where I do all my herbs now. So oh, cool. I think you built me four, three of them, three of them this year. Um, so it's a raised bed, um, basically built from the ground up um, with logs, sticks, manure. Um, we use the chicken manure, <laughs> um, grass clippings, coffee grounds, um, and then you top it off with the topsoil from the field. Oh, cool. Um, and so that's where all my herbs are this year. And they're doing amazing. So. Nice. Mm -hmm. And so a little bit more, you talked about your chickens. I know you guys have other livestock. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about all the different types of animals you've been trying to incorporate into your operation, not only just around the farmyard, but also on a larger scale in the field. Well, we haven't gotten any grazing out in the field yet but we did during COVID we did pursue the sheep industry I think we both felt we needed livestock on the farm and and uh, so we started raising sheep and uh, lambing so uh, um, yeah we haven't we only have like a 25 head breeding herd and we haven't grazed anything after harvest yet so that's one of our on our bucket list now. That's one of yeah. our goals for the future. So. And that's one of the big things that I think as more, like as you get rid of tillage, as you start implementing these practices, I think that's one thing people can start doing is trying to bring livestock, maybe not on a bigger scale, but like Renville County, we hardly have any <laughs> livestock now. Mm -hmm. And I think you're seeing people like you and your family, since you've getting rid of the tillage practicing in the fall, you're able to have more time to potentially get sheep on there, even at a small scale. And that it's such an important thing is incorporating that last principle of integrating livestock um, and getting that hoof action to break up any type of compaction that there might be and getting that natural source of manure that provides just what it can do for your soil um, is just a big thing. And it's just so cool to see that like, you've been doing this for five years now and now you're getting to the point where, oh, I want to start doing more and I want to just, it's fun to just see the stewardship of the land and how you guys just keep advancing that. And it's just really cool from like our perspective seeing that. So, so one thing was last year I grew eight acres of oats um, and I had a few other, I had barley mixed in with that and a few other things. So I combined that and then fed the grain to the sheep. And then after that, I seeded rye early. So that's where the benefit of the livestock is coming from because I wouldn't raise oats for for a commodity. I'd no. have to truck it yeah. 150 miles and still not get paid. Yeah. <laughs> probably not get paid very yeah. much for it. So uh, the small grains, I mean, I in my opinion, it's best to – walk that grain off the farm with livestock, feed yeah, it out. And, for sure. So. 
So we did get some benefit to the soil, even though well, we didn't, that's, didn't get the livestock on the and soil. And that's yet. just another, like, because you're doing your corn, your soybeans, and your rye. Well, now you're having oats out there, even if it's obviously you're doing it on different acres, and then you're mixing in that barley. That's just more and more diversity that you're bringing. That's just helping grow your soil, getting that different microorganisms that's working with that biology to just give you all those benefits that you're seeing like you were talking about less erosion i mean we got so much rain this year that you would i could not imagine having a conventional field just the (laughs) amount of washing that you could see just going down any of um, our county roads this year it was just really evident that whether it's drowned out spouts spots or um just washing in general um, and just protecting that soil, keeping it there. I mean, that's you're saving your soil, saving your fertilizer that you're putting out there. It's just keeping all that in place. That's just helping your crop. And then we also implemented the bees too to help with the pollination. And um, so we'll be harvesting that in the next week or so. Well, that'll be exciting. That'll be your first honey harvest, mm-hmm. or yeah, yes. cool. And do you have any? So to kind of go off the topic of more farming but do you have any like conservation ground with pollinators that your bees are out on during the year or where yeah. are you keeping your bees for the growing season we keep them on the, on our farm site but, okay but this year we did plant a half acre pollinator plot by our place and through equip we planted another one on the farm she grew up on you know whenever we entered that contract and yeah the contract is done now, but we leave the pollinator plot there for for everything. That's so. great. Um, to get, how do you think diversifying the crops have really and adding in the livestock? I know you haven't been like grazing them yet, but it's like you just said you were able to. You're planting oats, and barley mix. How? Do you think like the what changes have you seen like with the actual soil in this last five years or so that you've been doing this and what is the biggest change that it can be anything to the actual soil to your like daily lives to just your what has it done for you both well it makes my job less stressful because you don't have to manage tillage for one thing you just get rid of it other than, you know, when water ponds, you might have some residue built up that needs to go get pushed back or, or whatever. But uh, I, you know, I could just tell the so- soil is so much more healthy now. And a lot of it's just the earthworms. We get the little little bunches of residue and, and you know, so when I'm driving through the field, we got all these little worm piles out in the field, and you just go, yeah, it's, it's all working. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's really neat to see. And then even when you're traveling, you know, we know what our fields look like. And then when you're out traveling and you see all the fields that are worked and the dirt's flying and you just think, boy, they're losing a lot of their topsoil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just kind of neat to see the difference. Like um, you can definitely tell the color and the texture, everything. It's just really neat. I think the little earthworm mounds last last year in the garden really kind of blew your mind away yeah. there. When yeah, you've that seen that. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have so a lot of people. Their main concern is, oh, what am I going to do with all that residue? Um, how am I going to plant, or how is the crop going to come through that? What have you seen with like emergence of your corn and your soybeans through residue, and also how how long do you think it's taking to decompose that residue? Because I've been on farms where there's been no-till for 15 years now, and you go out in the middle of the summer, and there's not a single straw of rye or the corn residue is already almost gone. So kind of talk me through that, what you've seen with, like, residue management. or. Well, when I started, I bought a no-till drill because I knew I needed down pressure to get the seed in the ground. Um and then, so I would no-till soybeans, and then we were doing spring tillage before corn planting. And yeah, the first year, I think the first two years of no-till soybeans, 
I think they were wet years. And by the time you went over it with the combine, yeah, there was the, the corn stalk standing up or some of them. And that would run through the combine. So, but that was about it. That's all you had left in fall. <laughs> yeah. And then, I don't know if it was last year or which year it was now, they all kind of run together. No, I think it was the third year it was dry. And I thought, well, this will be the test, you know, how much corn residue is going to, how, how much corn stover is going to be left after soybeans. And there wasn't any. It, it just eats it all up. Yeah. And, uh, the only thing is, uh, like I've been seeding in some drown out spots, and I can see the corn rut from two years ago or three years ago now. But it's like, yeah, well, I don't want them on top anyhow. They're very hard and fibrous and just leave them in the ground. The ground will take care of them. <laughs> and from the smaller perspective of the garden, it's more like a mulch. So it's not any different than using a mulch out there and it just kind of takes care of itself. So. Yeah, and that's like last year how you said you had one of your better years in the garden and we were so dry. Like yeah. we've been so wet this year, and last year is the, the complete opposite. And that kind that mulch factoring, both in the garden and in the crop field, really helps with moisture. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, like this year, it's been super wet. Do you in both the garden and in the um, row crops? What do you think has helped the most with like moisture control out there, preventing like drowned outs? Oh, our drainage ditches overflow, so we still get the drown notes. Yep. But uh, I don't know. It was it was just so wet that <laughs> I I don't care to judge anything th this year. But uh, I don't know. I mean, when we sprayed when I sprayed soybeans, it, it still carried well. I had to drive around ponds because there was that much water out there when I was spraying soybeans and. Uh, you know, in between, it's still carried well. Yeah, and that just relates back to that structure of what, by not tilling, you're just keeping that structure and your structure's able to carry equipment, which I think is fascinating in the whole <laughs> engineering or whatever you want to say of soil and how you can just build that structure where you can carry this huge equipment even when there's standing water. That just is amazing to me. And as far as my herb gardens, I mean, the, the mound gardening, that the wetness didn't affect it at all because they, yeah. they did really well. No, that's really good to hear. Um, what type of cover crops are you using and, like, how are you selecting those mixes? Uh, some of it is based on the programs that, it, that you might be in. Uh, if it's not in a program, typically it's just a rye winter cereal rye but uh, otherwise we'll blend winter cereal rye and winter triticale and uh, the latest one that I'm using now is camelina which helps reduce the seeding rate in fall because just about everything gets drilled in after harvest and fall but it, you might actually end up with more seeds per acre because camelina is just the tiniest little thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah of a seed so um that would probably be the latest thing is is more camelina in there and it's a different species so what about for the garden naomi what are you are you guys seeding cover crops in the garden at all or um well a lot of them kind of are their own cover crops if that makes yeah. sense because there's such a variety in there we've we've been doing the bigger garden out in the field right. like we'll just pick a quarter acre so, so it's, it's kind of what's what's there yeah. so the mounds are more the smaller stuff is more the herbs and then yeah. the tomatoes and put basil in with that so and so are you rotating your garden around like a quarter acre here this year and the next yep. year is a different quarter acre. Yep. yeah and then you're planting row crops back into where the garden was wow yep. that is that's really cool <laughs> and so do you with like gardening, how has how has it changed? Like when you used to have to, like, were you doing this large of a scale of a garden before? 
We oh. had not as big, but we had okay. a pretty good sized garden. Um, it definitely did not fare as well as it has been. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it just didn't grow very well, or if we did have the big rains, it would get more drowned out. Um, so per- Perpetual weeding. Yes, <laughs> and I really don't have to weed a whole lot, honestly, <laughs> so well, that's yeah. nice. Well, last year we didn't have to weed much. This year it got a little. Little what what this, this is a good year for water hemp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's been much better. So. Nice. Do you with your vegetables and your produce, do you take them to farmers markets or is it just all Yeah. Yep. Um so I have done peaches and cherries, um working on some apple cider, um and then the herbs making it to oils and tinctures, so Cool. Yep. And do you think like the additional time of not having to weed or like the less maintenance you've had to do, do you think that's helped you expand your garden and kind of for sure, yeah. do the rest of it? <laughs> then yeah. I'm able to do a lot more. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. So with your cover crops, what are the main things you're looking for right now? In- right now I would say winter survivability because I'm seeding in fall, but... Uh, so with that, then I want, for me, it's all about the roots and improving the soil. It's it's not really what's growing on top, but um, it, I would like to maybe move into in, interseeding into the living corn and soybean crop next. And uh, I think it would be very beneficial if you could have a, a green mat there when you run over with the car, with the combine. So your residue has a yeah. carpet to lay on. I think it would probably disappear even that much faster. I did broadcast an interseeder mix and in some corn last year, and uh, of course we didn't get rain till September, so it didn't grow until then. But it was pretty pretty neat to see a, a green grass in some, at least in some spots when I went through with the combine. I thought that was pretty. Pretty neat, but it was so dry last year that yeah. a lot of stuff just didn't. A lot of it didn't grow. Have you noticed anything in like your fertility program, and you've been able to change any of that, or in your soil tests? I haven't been doing a lot of soil testing. I did do some grid sampling last fall, um, and then I, I compared to that. It had been grid sampled several years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And it seemed to me in general, like the organic matter maybe came up a little bit and the pH maybe dropped a little bit. Okay. And as far as fertility goes, I didn't broadcast any P and K last year for this year's mm-hmm. corn crop. I used in, in the furrow starter and, uh, you know, the, the corn crop is what it is this year. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it's you know, no, I don't think anybody's corn is going to be anything special this year. So, I, I don't feel I missed out anything there. So, uh, I'm trying to reduce fertilizer usage through tillage. That is something that, the way I viewed it, it just seems like the more tillage you, you do, the more fertilizer you're going to need. I've reduced my mm-hmm. end rate down to 140 pounds an acre for corn. And do you know what you were at when you were? 180. Okay, yeah. After soybeans, yeah. Yeah, so. 40 pounds, that's a big difference, especially with nitrogen prices. And I think that's, uh, like, Mother Nature provides so much in the soil that where most people that are doing no-till and strip-till don't even have to put P and K down anymore because once you start activating that biology, the soil can naturally provide most of the P and K that you need. Obviously for corn, you're still going to need your nitrogen, but you can like 40 pounds, that's a big difference. And you're, I'm, are you still seeing the same yield for the most part? I reduced the rate some last year. I think it was down to 160 last year. And I can't say that I noticed anything. And this year I was going to, well, this year, well, I was gonna. I side dressed last year too, but uh, I thought, well, I don't know that I really need any more. And if I feel I need more, you could put more on with the yeah. side dress. Yep. So 
Well, this year I never even got the side dress application done. It was just that wet. So <laughs> yeah, and I think it's just the by keeping that soil alive by not tilling it by putting your covers in there. All that everything you both are doing is just that's allowing you to make these changes that will make your operation and your whole farming operation more profitable and more sustainable going forward. So that's really, really good to hear. I never had, you know, the idea or the concept or the belief that I could do that when I was in conventional tillage. I mean, you just, if you're in conventional tillage, you don't do things like that. Yeah. You kind of still have to stick to the formula, but yeah. I don't know. I, I had one patch of corn. It was between, it was kind of in the building site. It was between a shelter belt and a machine shed. I didn't have it highlighted on the map for the applic uh, nitrogen application that year. So the co-op, and I believe it was strip tilled that year, and then the co-op spread urea in spring. Well, they didn't hit that corner because I didn't have it on the map. Well, you couldn't tell the difference between that patch and, and the normal corn until I went through with the combine. And then, you, then I noticed it yielded less. Just visually, there was it was just as green as the other. <laughs> yeah, oh. and that was maybe three or four years ago. Okay. So. In regards to like crop resiliency to weather events, have you? I know, like down in your area where you guys farm, it's you're prone to get bigger rainfall events, bigger wind events. Have you noticed any difference in the like structural integrity of the crop, whether it's bean or corn, where on big winds, is your saying that is your corn maybe standing up more than neighbors potentially? I would say, generally speaking, and Naomi runs the combine too. I don't know if you can speak to that, but I, I know you've combined down corn in years past, but so she knows. There hasn't been as much, I feel like, in the last few years. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have nearly as much breaking down from wind like we used to. And maybe maybe no-till isn't the only reason why, but I, I think it's definitely one of them. So. I actually just had a patient yesterday tell me they were driving past on Highway 19 by our other farm, and he said, "Boy, your beans look really good out there." So yeah, I just people people notice, I think so. And I think that goes back to the fertility and not applying as much P and K. Our a lot of our soybeans. Yeah, a lot. There's a lot of drawn out spots, but where they're left, they they really came through in the end here. They look real nice. So, I think that's I think that stands for the fertility part of it too. That you don't need all that fertility poured on yeah. to get them to look good. So, <laughs> yeah. What What are some things that you both are looking to try in the future potentially? with your farm? Uh, I think interseeding corn, corn and soybeans both. Um, so this, this year, just a few days ago, we, I had grown wheat this year with the plan of just selling it on the cash market. Well, then the cash market fell apart. So I changed my plan. I just put it in the bin and we're going to feed it to the sheep and whatever other livestock <laughs> that we need to to get rid of it because yeah. I, I just won't give it away. I, yep. I just won't do it. So uh, so I planted some winter rye and some winter triticale after the wheat now, and that's we'll have some nitrogen put on it since it's after wheat. Um, so with that, we'll grow some of our own cover crop seed. My plan is... Part of the rye, I will round bale next summer. And then I want to try a hay crop, a summer hay crop, like a, like a millet or something like that after, after baling some rye. And I think, I think hay would be a good diversification, not alfalfa per se, but if we could get, you know, in drowned out spots or, or plant yeah. your own cover crop and then put a 
hay crop in after that if there's time. I think that's such a big thing with you both bringing livestock back, livestock back into the operation is if the market on one of your small grains goes in the drain, <laughs> you have that option instead of being forced to sell it because you don't want to take up grain space, you know, or bin space, you know that, oh, I now have the opportunity to feed my sheep and other opportunities um, throughout the winter. And I think it's just there's so much more you can do and there's so much more just resiliency throughout the operation because you have those options. You're not forced to go and give away <laughs> wheat for free where you can just keep it on the farm and make benefit of that that way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, if it, w if it wasn't for the livestock, I don't, I don't know that I would have grown the wheat. Uh, my, my plan was to pattern tile that field where everything got so late that didn't happen either now. But, yeah. uh, I mean, that was always in the back of my mind. Well, if, if things don't pan out, then they could just feed it. And well, that's what happened. So, <laughs> yeah. In the future, I know you're planning on pattern tiling it this year so you probably didn't do a diverse mix but would you ever think about doing like a diverse mix on those small grain acres uh well so the other half of the the wheat acres did get planted into a cover crop i just did that this week so there's winter winter rye winter triticale um i had a bag of radish laying in the shed i threw that in uh hairy vetch Camelina, a couple units of treated soybean seed, get rid of that, put it in the ground. Um, <laughs> and I think I had a bag of lentils from last year or two years ago. But, yeah, so we, I put that in. as Just kind of a smorgasbord. Yeah. That'll be cool to see it green up because with this warm weather and hopefully rain we're going to get, um, <laughs> it'll be nice to see some green going into winter, I bet. Yeah, and even an inch deep, there's still moisture there. I don't yeah. know if it was quite enough to get things to germinate. I think we'll need a rain here. But, yep. yeah, once you break through it, it's there's still moisture under there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What about you, Naomi? What do you think the um, things you want to try going forward? Um, I'd like to do some sunflowers um, and then try pressing or doing our own oils for that, so. Cool. And yeah. Continue just expanding and experimenting with all the different herbs and stuff. So that'll be really fun to see and just see how that goes. Um, kind of, I want to pick your ba brain, well, both of you, on the whole. I know you have a, a lot of drain tile in your fields because you're <laughs> in some very heavy, wet soils with drainage ditches coming through. Do you think you've seen your like your utilization of your drain tile, like the efficiency of your drain tile increase with the starting to do no-till and cover crops. And like the theory is you're getting more infiltration, so more of that water is actually reaching the drain tile through the soil profile rather than through just running over through land the into the intakes. Um, I just am curious. I don't know if it is either way. It's just a question I had. Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't say that I've really looked for that, but, uh, and I've never done a soil absorption test. Is that what they call it? The, you know, the, how many inches the, per hour? The infiltration test. Infiltration tests, yeah. test. Yeah. I've never done that, but I know I've, I've seen it in the rains where it just, the water, there's no water there and the neighbor's field has is glossy black and there's a little puddle here and a little puddle there. Well, ours just soaks right in. So I, I know we have the infiltration, but um, as far as drain tile efficiency, I don't know. I I, uh, I imagine it would. I mean, if it's in the soil and goes, yeah. filters through the soil before it filters through the tile. The you just get way more like water quality benefits too by not even you're not doing anything you're just allowing it to natural all the fertilizer and any type of 
herbicides or insecticides that are sprayed can actually get through and dissolve in the soil and get eaten up by those microbes instead of washing over ground through the intakes and then just straight. Yeah, no, I just didn't know if, if you'd notice anything. I was just curious about that. If someone wants to make the jump like you did five years ago, what would your piece of advice be or what do you, what could they expect to see? I don't know. It, it's kind of, it's the same as when I did tillage. You know, when I plant, I stop and I get out and look and see what's going on. <laughs> It's, yeah, it you got to do that no matter what, and uh, I I I didn't make the leap without buying the no-till drill because I knew I needed down pressure, and I know people had said, well, once you get to a certain point, you don't even need all that down pressure. Well, I had to get to that point first, so yeah, make sure you know what your equipment's doing when you're when you're no-tilling, same as when you're tilling. Have you had to make any significant equipment? adjustments to your combine or your planter uh well the planter so the corn planter i never did make any adjustments i was but i was we were doing spring tillage at first and then we kind of went to strip till i still didn't make any adjustments on the corn planter uh the the beans were still no-till drill but i've no-till corn it was just a standard corn planter and i didn't and you're didn't have an, with that. Yeah, didn't have an issue. But that was a few years in. Um, I had a plan B in the back of my mind. I knew where I could get uh, down pressure springs if I really needed to do that in season just to get corn planted. Um, the combine, now that you bring it up, combining soybeans is way easier now than it's ever been because you can just smack the head on the ground and go mm-hmm. the, you know you have soil structure and you do have the corn stalks uh, my my dad combined soybeans until he was 86 I suppose and you know he he was not really in favor of this no-till stuff but boy, he sure thought that all worked good because he could just put the bean head on the ground and go. His his combine, the, <laughs> the flex, the auto flex didn't even work anymore. Yeah. Why well, not? You know, I wasn't going to ruin it for him and tell him no tills the reason you can combine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you just put the head on the ground and go, and it's you know, and you know, back thirty years ago and even longer with this with older equipment, we always had problems the bean head digging into the ground because you guys moldboard plowed and Mm -hmm. and uh i know that old combine from the early 70s well then the bean head would want to dig into the ground if you got too low and and uh well you don't there's very little dirt there's floats across yeah just rides across it's it combining beans has never been so easy since i went no-till so (laughs) well that's uh a lot less rocks to pick too, because there yeah. were many a hour I spent picking rocks, and you know, heaven forbid you miss one, you find it and fall. <laughs> that's not good. So. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as livestock goes, um, rotating the livestock, we're trying to figure out the best fencing, um, the water source, um, and then we do have a couple guard donkeys, which are good. But then I think, well, we only have two of them, and if we start, set, you know, putting goats out in the grove to kind of help clean up and then the sheep out in an area the best protection for them too so um, that's kind of what we're kind of what we're working on too what else do you think by implementing these soil health practices and having livestock and expanding your garden might allow you both to do in the future with whether it's more time or just less less intensive time spent on the cropping side of things. So one thing that I think would be really interesting um, is um, implementing a place for kids. Um, so there is um, there is a lady that I've seen. Um, she's got a place called the Little Red School House where she has kids, I think, um, preschool age through about fifth, sixth grade come. Um, and they have a little curriculum. So half the day is spent learning different curriculum and the other half they're outside um, working with animals, um, 
working in the gardens. Um, and then um, the food that they grow is what they eat there. And I just think that would be a really neat opportunity to eventually consider building and growing here in our community. So. Yeah, I think that's such a big thing, too, because there's so many as small towns get smaller and more people move to cities. I think that's just such a like a lost like people just aren't ex children aren't exposed to those type of things anymore. Like when I was a kid, we took lots of field trips to like two or three a year to go to farms and see livestock and get to play with all that stuff. And I think there's lots of other health benefits too by kids being exposed to that things right. as well. And now having a granddaughter, I just think that's a fun opportunity for her to learn, you know, and grow too. And um, I do remember um, when my niece came from the cities and she was staying with my mother-in-law and um, they were making a cake and frosting and they made homemade frosting and she said, you can make your own frosting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it just came in a jar. Yeah. Um, so... I don't know. I just think um, that would be a really fun opportunity to work towards and um, to be able to have kids come out and work with the animals and um, have them grow the food and make the food. And I think that would be fun to do. That's such a cool thing. And without, like, I think it just brings it back to what we, like we were talking about before, how like not only can Mother Nature provide so much for the crops, it can also provide so much for like us and children and just learning more about how like all this, how things come and how things come to be um, and all that. So yeah, that's, that's really cool. Hopefully, hopefully that works out. Yeah. <laughs> Baby steps, but I think we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That is all exciting stuff. Well, <laughs> I really appreciate you both willing to come on to the podcast. I think there's just such a wealth of knowledge that you both have from both the cropping system and just gardening in general. And it's just really cool to see like all aspects, whether it's your garden, the farm, um, bringing in the livestock. It's just, you kind of have, every, you both are doing everything. And it's kind of <laughs> really cool that we have it happening in Renville County and you're having success with all of it. So with that, unless you both have anything else you'd like to talk about, I think we'll call her good. Well, I think we got the confidence to do a larger garden because we're not doing all this tillage. And I mean, I'm not spending as much time out in the field, you know, row crop cultivating or whatever. And, and, uh, I think it's just a you know soil health aspect to the human health aspect and yeah and uh, yeah last year was the first time we did it out in the field a garden out in the field and it was just unbelievable how green all those vine plants were all the squash and the pumpkin and it was just huge and you talk to gardeners and they don't they don't know what no-till means you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> It's pretty exciting that way. So, and I think too, just the like not having to weed. I think you just have so much more time where you can just plant, yeah. hope for good hope for good rain, and then just go harvest. Yeah. I think that's a big thing too. So, well, thank you both, and please tune in next week for our next episode. Have a good rest of the week. <laughs>